I'm Joe Devine and welcome to Whiteboard Football Extra. A quick note before we get started with today's podcast. The series is now available to listen to on iTunes and SoundCloud as well as YouTube. If you're listening on YouTube, a link to our iTunes page will be provided in the description. To new listeners, this podcast gives us an opportunity to go into a greater depth about some of the topics we cover in the videos on our YouTube channel. We create a series of animated videos called Whiteboard Football, covering everything from tactics and stats to the history and the rules of the game. On this podcast, I'll be joined by the writers of those videos and also the journalists who write articles for our editorial site at umaxit.com. Each episode will relate to either the topic of a recent video, an article, or a specific story. You don't need to watch the videos or read the articles to listen to this podcast, but if you'd like to, a link to each will always be provided in the description. And please visit umaxit.com, where we release multiple editorial pieces per day, and search Umaxit Football on YouTube to find the videos. Today, I'm joined by Seb stafford Bloor content editor of umaxit.com to talk about John Terry who recently announced that he'll be leaving Chelsea at the end of the season and defending. At the end of the episode I'll also be reading Stephen Tudor's recent piece on waving imaginary cards at referees. Seb, John Terry has announced that he'll be leaving Chelsea at the end of the season after, what's, 22 years at the club. He says he feels he still has plenty to offer and that he'll be seeking a new challenge with a new club. Um, where do you think he could go? Uh, I suppose that's two different questions, really. I, I think, um, like everybody else, I had the sort of the, um, I had Tony Pulis pipe up shortly after that, that announcement was made. And, you know, you could certainly... Um, you could certainly see Terry joining uh, West Brom's army of centre halves. Um, I don't know. I, mean, I, I think Joe it depends on what his motivations are. I mean, I think that um, you know, I, I know MLS is is undergoing a little bit of a, a change in focus and trying to move away from the old, um, you know, to, to trying to move away from recruiting sort of aging players who were at one point iconic. But I think maybe Terry at this point is entitled to to make a decision based on what uh, he wants for his family in the future and, you know, to take money in a, in a lesser league if he wants. But I, 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 I don't disagree with him. I think he probably, uh, he doesn't, he can't offer what he once offered um, because he is well past his prime now, but he is, uh, you know, he could probably still do something for a uh, mid to lower level Premier League team. It's difficult for us to say, isn't it? Because we haven't seen him playing so regularly. Well, this that's season. it, isn't it? He just doesn't. He he's sort of he's been very much a background character in this season, and um, I I haven't I, I haven't seen him play a minute of football um, in, in any of the games that I've seen at Chelsea or you know anywhere else, uh, which is a very weird thing to say after all this time. Um, but no, I um, I don't know. I mean, um, yeah, very hard to say. Interesting in a. Interesting with a, a small I and inverted commas, maybe. But I suppose in his absence, we're, we're seeing a Chelsea team um, that that has a, a slightly different uh, symbolic defender, I suppose you could say, at the back in in, in David Luiz. How do you think he's made out this season so far? Uh, ooh, a tricky one. I, I I think sort of the consensus is that uh, Luiz has been a bit of a revelation since he came back from PSG, and that you know all the all the mirth which greeted his re-signing was misplaced. Uh, I think he's done quite well. Um, I don't think um, I, 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 I'm like everything at Chelsea. I, I think it's very hard to um, to to assess his performance without applying the lens of N'Golo Kante, um, because so much of what Chelsea do well comes from the strength of their central midfield and the way that uh, that Kante also Nemanja Matic, the way they protect their centre halves. I think that Luis uh, has played well, but I. I sort of I retain the belief that he's still quite an error prone, error prone player. Uh, actually, as we saw against Manchester United, I don't think he necessarily um, covered himself in glory during uh, Manchester United's first goal. Um, quick as Marcus Rashford is, um, I think he is fundamentally still the same player. But you know, you, you can't um, you can't say that sort of from a leadership and emotional standpoint that he hasn't been very important. I think he he's done as good a job as as could ever have been expected uh, of filling whatever void Terry's absence left in the side. Um, he's certainly a character. He's certainly a very well-liked person. 
he is whatever else you say about him he is someone that cares very deeply about whichever team he's playing for and you know the fans he represents and so yeah he's he's certainly certainly, um he's certainly been useful Connor Kelly wrote about John Terry recently for umaxit.com and discussing the uh, the player's legacy, questioning how he might be uh, remembered. He writes, removing grievances surrounding his personality and evaluating him solely as a player, Terry should be recognised as the elite calibre defender he was. He was commanding in the air, strong in the tackle, his positional awareness was uncanny, and he was always willing to subject himself to pain in order to prevent or score a goal. I don't think anybody would doubt uh, that Terry's ability as a player but when we do remember him you know is it possible or is it fair even to forget any grievances surrounding his personality or you know the 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 controversial moments during his career uh fair is a hard word joe i i I don't know i mean i can only speak from the way I, i i can only speak using my own reference points and the way i look at john terry i mean we also published an article by Dan Levine yesterday. Uh, I think that comes out today, actually, Wednesday. Um, Dan actually covered the... He was actually in the courtroom when uh, John Terry's um, CPS trial uh, went on. Um, I don't I don't think this is necessarily about Terry. I think this is necessarily about you know, sort of the, the construct known as the modern player in that I don't know whether... It, it's not a question of whether it's right or wrong to separate playing personalities from character. I just think it's very difficult to do that because the nature of the game and the kind of the publicity surrounding it means that invariably um, a, a player's personal life is in play uh, throughout his career. Um, and also the nature of what John Terry was accused of um, and the details which have been made public of that case, it, it's very, very difficult to, 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 to compartmentalise that. Um, and to seal it away from what he was as a player, I think it's entirely legitimate. However, to to recognise who he was as a player and to um, to bracket him with that kind of golden generation of of English centre halves, but I don't think you can necessarily criticise anyone that wants to asterisk. Um, sort of, I mean, I, I suppose this goes back to the way that Terry is often presented because. Connor is absolutely right. He should be recognised as a, an outstanding defender. However, um, a lot of his reputation relies on his emotional characteristics. So, you know, if you if you go to Stamford Bridge, you know, the celebration of Terry is not uh, great positioning, good in the air, brave as a lion. It's captain leader legend. Um, and captain leader legend. Um, and that's... That kind of invokes... A lot of the, um, a lot of the characteristics which people take issue with. Um, I don't think he's a particularly good role model. I don't think he's ever necessarily tried to be. Um, and that's a different debate altogether. But it, it's a hard one. I, I, it's, it's a very, it's a very murky situation. And I, I can, can't. Can I can I ask you actually what what is it about Terry that you think makes him not a good role model? Well, okay, we starting at the Anton Ferdinand situation, I think the way that the details of that encounter were trawled through court, I don't think that presented him in a particularly flattering light. And the sort of the uh, unapologetic way in which that was conducted didn't sort of... It sort of... It depicted that rather as the norm within football, which was very ugly. And um, from my own perspective, um, set a very unhealthy precedent um in the sense of like well you know it's football therefore this is acceptable that's acceptable and this is kind of okay because you know within this particular context all's what all's fair which i i I just don't agree with that and i also think um uh yeah i i i i I don't want to i mean the difficulty here is that sort of um a lot of what a lot of this discussion involves things which have been reported rather than confirmed about him. And we can't really get ourselves into libel trouble, uh, obviously. You know, I, 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 just, I don't think... OK, for instance, I don't think the sort of the generally accepted image of John Terry from outside Stanford Bridge, which, you know, considers everything that he's been associated with throughout his career is necessarily particularly wholesome. Um, I'll put it that way, tactfully. Elliot Rothwell also recently wrote an article for umaxit.com about Terry um, 
fan, him being the last of England's golden generation of centre-backs. Now, obviously, he's not played with the international team for some years. Um, but what do you make of the, the current generation of England defenders? And, and as a sort of secondary question, do you think it was just a coincidence that England had a number of very dominant centre-backs a decade ago? Or is it perhaps more, you know, is it just emblematic of a downturn across the board generally? What, what do you think about that? I, I, I like to think of it, and this may look quite silly in a few years, as a, a little bit of a, an anomaly. Because in both senses, I think sort of the glut of talented centre-halves was uh, coincidental. I mean, to have that group, to have Rio Ferdinand and John Terry and uh, uh, Ledley King as well as the one that people forget and Sol Campbell. And even, I mean, the layer below that was pretty talented too. I mean, you're, you're sort of someone like Jonathan Woodgate, had he had he stayed fit throughout his career, would have probably been a 50, 60 cap international. He was a, a fabulous centre half. Um, the current generation, no, not particularly talented. Um but then I look at sort of, I, I spend a little bit of time um, trying to, not necessarily covering, but, you know, spending time around the age group teams and, and trying to watch them as and when they play around the country. And um, I think there are some extremely good centre-halves in there. Um, probably the pick of the bunch, I would say, is Trevor Chalabar, who is Nathaniel Chalabar's um, younger brother. Um, I don't know whether he'll end up as a centre half or whether, like his brother, he'll kind of migrate into midfield. But he's uh, he, he's he's as talented a centre back as I've seen in a really long time, um, through my sort of amateur eyes. Uh, not claiming any kind of scouting expertise, it's just you know, sort of very very hard to ignore what he is. I mean, he he's, looks excellent. Um, and in all honesty, Joe, I don't know enough about the sort of the systems within the individual clubs which which govern um, talent production to say whether sort of the kind of either the current generation the previous one or the next one are, are, the, are the um are the result of anything other than you know the random nature of um of talent i guess i, I was thinking more about um perhaps the, the more generalized style in which clubs in the premier league would play or okay. perhaps the idea that uh, there was more opportunity or that you know could you make an argument that there was more opportunity to, for english players 10 years ago than there is now well, I, I think it's funny. I mean, I, I think um, one of the great ironies is that the, 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 some of the, the centre halves within that, that generation. So, for, ex- for instance, um, Rio Ferdinand. Um, Rio Ferdinand is not a traditional English centre half at all. He is not sort of what whilst Terry is in the kind of block shots with your balls kind of way. Um, you know, win everything in the air. You know, take an elbow to the face as many times as he needs to kind of guy. Because um, Terry belongs in a sort of a low block type system. Um, which is very English, you know, very traditional. Whereas Ferdinand, to a degree, Sol Campbell, certainly Ledley King, you know, play Woodgate as well. Players like that, they were ball playing footballers, ball playing centre backs, um, and they would probably um, they would probably achieve far more in the current era, where the default is for um, you know possession at the uh, 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 in the in the in the defensive third to work the ball into midfield or or to a sort of um, to. Uh, to advanced full backs or wing backs, whatever. Um, so I, I don't know if it's something which, which has come as a result of changing fashions and, and preferences. I, I just, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have the knowledge to, to, to sort of draw those lines, if you know what I mean. Um, I, I wouldn't be, uh, yeah, I don't speak from any kind of authority, so... Well, Elliot also notes in a separate piece um, the absence of defenders from this year's PFA Player of the Year shortlist um, and the inclusion of just one, Michael Keane, in the young players list. John Terry was the last player to win this award. That's 12 years ago now. Um, And the lack of defenders in these individual award lists is a fairly common theme. Obviously, goals are the glamour of football um, and attacking players are recognised for this reason. We should also note that these awards are essentially meaningless to all but the players, you know, themselves. But given that it seems, to me at least, that a high quality defender in the Premier League is is possibly harder to come by, or you know, maybe a, a, a rarer player than you know a decent attacking player, it, doesn't it make sense to see more defenders recognised for their achievements? Yes, but uh, this is, you know, of course, it does, and I would also. Beyond defenders, I would also say goalkeepers. I want to say, I think, I mean, I'd have to look this up. I think Peter Shilton is the last goalkeeper to win a, an individual award, right? Um, which is a, a very long time ago. Unless you count Manchester United's Player of the Year award. Which, which no one does, of course. Every, every <laughs> <Yeah. season. laughs> I think the award's named after him now. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I do. But, Joe, this is a, a cultural thing. It's a, 
you know that that strikes right at the heart of you know what it is that people enjoy about football and it's all very well sitting on twitter uh, amongst you know a sea of journalists and experts and you know fans that pay attention to every detail within the game but then i i don't think that's net as you know i'm sure the general election will remind us <laughs> social media not necessarily reflective of of the world outside um, i wonder i wonder if it is a cultural thing though or or is it you know another thing i've considered is that it's it's not so much a cultural thing and it's more just a systematic thing it's it, it's more it's more to do with how football is played at the, in different positions and i think one of the things that you know we've i've come to learn talking to alex stewart about uh, the tactics videos that we've been making on the channel is that it's very difficult you know it's very difficult when you're looking at a team statistically to qualify how well a defender has been playing because there are less available statistics uh, to you know, give a complete picture of, of defending, and I think the reason for that, and the same, you know, is, is tactically, is that defenders uh, consistently have to work as a group, you know, and their their um, individual skill is is, I suppose, less valued uh, to the team than it is to a striker who might who might you know work as a team and might make little connections around the box, but also might just break out pass three people on their own and score a goal that's that's obviously you know very obvious use of individual skill but a defender for the vast majority of the game if not all the game has to work in coalition with three or you know, four other players all the time and so I wonder if it's it's not so much that you know they're, they're not deserving of the awards but it's harder to separate them you know because I think you look at the teams that have defended well this season uh, Chelsea and Tottenham I think have the best records Manchester United are up there as well you know let's let's take uh Tottenham for example you you wouldn't really want to pick out necessarily Aldo Alderweireld without uh mentioning Vertonghen as well you kind of think well that those guys are a team they defend together so it's harder I think to uh, individually pick out players I I I think I well I think that's very true I I think also um removing kind of any sort of metric you use to to measure a player's performance I think from a sort of a sensory and visual level um Attacking positions are always far more associated with expression and skill, whereas, especially in this country, those qualities in defenders tend to be um, tend to be bracketed with risk and um, you know a player being a liability. Um, I think also one of the kind of the uh, an obvious point that I'm always guilty of overlooking, and it only really occurs to me in hindsight, is that actually, you know. Um, the individual awards tend always to go to the most successful teams. And the most successful teams tend, I mean, by perception rather than necessarily in reality, um, are not as reliant on the defences. I mean, that ultimately, that's actually not really true because Chelsea have been defensively excellent this season. Tottenham, ditto. Of course they have. And actually, Manchester United would be in mid-table were it not for their defence, regardless of what someone like Zlatan Ibrahimovic has done. I mean, it's just that that, that is the way of it. However, I think sort of when when the average fan, the average reporter, or, or sort of if if we're talking about the PFA awards, the average sort of player thinks back. So if you're asked, you know, who is your player of this season, that sort of conjures images of of highlights, doesn't it? Because that's how the, I, I suppose that's how most people assess performance. So rather than thinking, well, I remember that game where you know um, Toby Alderweireld, uh, you know, read that through ball perfectly, cut it off, and then just dropped it back to Hugo Lloris. You're not really thinking about that. You're thinking about sort of the thirty yarder that Harry Kane ripped in against Everton, for instance, or something that Deli Ali might have done. I just think that's that sort of um, rewarding defenders seems to contradict one of the the sort of the main informal rules about recalling football seasons. Um, it's it's interesting. I I mean, Alderweireld is a really good example, and Vertonghen too, because I think actually, if you asked most Tottenham fans um, which player, because obviously Tottenham have experienced a lot of injuries this season, um, and tellingly, the one that caused the most despair was when Alderweireld went down at West Brom. Um, not Kane, you know, uh, not Vertonghen, not Rose. You know, I mean, maybe Hugo Lloris might fall, in, fall into that category as well, but he hasn't really had any sustained injury difficulties um it's i think um yeah i i i it's very hard to explain that whilst tallying it with the sort of the the preference for forward players at um at uh you know during award season um but it just seems to be the way that i think play i think fans have a great appreciation for defensive output and you know certainly during a game there is i mean i don't think people 
uh, look at. I, I I don't think there's any naivety in, in the way that fans look at um, the, the art of defending or the art of playing without the ball. I, I I just think it's a sort of it's. I just really do believe it's a recall thing. And finally, this is a reading from Stephen Tudor's recent article: "Waving imaginary cards is not an outrage. The outrage it causes is." You can find this article on umaxit.com. This is not a defence of players and managers who wave imaginary cards in the referee's direction. There is no defence for it. The mime constitutes unsportsmanlike behaviour and essentially amounts to one professional trying to get another into trouble. We used to call that dobbing back in school. Sir, Stephen has just emptied my Manchester United pencil case onto the floor and said that Brian McClare is a turd. Nobody comes out of that little vignette well but at least being seven years old is a caveat. So, to witness successful athletes who have reached the very pinnacle of their life's pursuit dob in a similar fashion is distasteful. It evokes mild irritation and vicarious embarrassment on their behalf. Typically, I will tut. If I'm in a really bad mood, I might roll my eyes a little. There is nothing, though, a mere itch to a thousand bee stings compared to the glutteral annoyance that swells up inside of me whenever I encounter the hysteria that is unleashed from others when they witness the harmless motion. Whether it be a commentator going all colonial and feeling the need to educate Johnny Foreigner with supercilious scorn, or a supporter going puce with bewildered rage because the player in question may as well have flobbed in the face of one of the Marquess of Queensbury's surviving relatives. I find the reactions to be hypocritical, delusional and, in a nutshell, pure Brexit. It is hypocritical because five minutes earlier that same supporter was loudly calling the ref the C-word because he had declined the opportunity to caution an opposing player. His outburst, strewn with incentives that queried both the official's ability and parentage, had most likely contained the phrase, get him in the book, referee. Five minutes before that, a handful of players had crowded around the man in green, their arms outstretched in protest, their faces scrunched in hate as they screamed out insults from close quarters that are clearly lip-read by impressionable kids who mimic such behaviour in their under-12 games because they want to be as passionate as their heroes. The commentator then had shown no indignation towards their aggressive pleas for punishment as a teammate lay stricken on the turf. Instead, he'd ramped up the drama and articulated their injustice with the aid of several replays paused on impact. Yet, strangely, when a player mimics the brandishing of a card from several feet away, reminding the official that this is the third time the opposing left-back has purposefully taken him out with a trip, shirt pull, or obstruction, and is long overdue a booking by the rules of the game, he has somehow violated the very values on which this great nation was founded. Which brings us to the delusional part, the notion that us Brits adhere to a sense of fair play over and above all other nationalities. It's a self-bestowed quality that I have always personally had a problem with, leading as it does to piety, as if we're the arbitrators of what is acceptable and what is not. This collective smugness would be insufferable enough, but it gets infinitely worse when it becomes selective to the point where a player born overseas caught diving is a cheat who deserves the gallows. An English forward doing similar is streetwise, competitive. Compromised values have very little value at all. But even knowing this, because the last point raised is hardly an original one, and if anything has become an accepted truth and borderline cliché, it doesn't stop us. If anything, it only perversely fuels the anger more when a player with Mediterranean skin or a manager wearing Italian loafers shakes his clenched hand into the air which is where the Brexit pig-headedness rears its head, a head incidentally that looks not dissimilar to Ray Winston, because even though we know the miming of a card being shown is an inconsequential act in comparison to other sins committed on a pitch, we view it, rightly or wrongly, as a cultural habit imported from abroad, which automatically means that different logic applies and all tolerance is thrown out of the window. It was perfectly fine that Wayne Rooney spent a whole career refing games, spending half his time in the official's ear and the other half calling him salty names. It was also fine that Alex Ferguson bullied them remorsely while his habit of tapping his watch on the touchline affectionately became known as Fergie time. It's fine because they were British, damn it, and that's how we bend the rules, old chap. How dare you come over here and protest differently from a respectful distance with a reminder of Law 12. We once had an empire, you know. 
Of course, the waving of an imaginary red card is always an unedifying sight, and this is not a defence of the players and the managers who do so. But the reasons behind the outrage that routinely accompanies it are much more unsavoury still. In truth, we deserve a yellow for it. It's tired old xenophobia dressed up as moral superiority. I'll be sure to keep my hands in my pockets when I request such a punishment. Get it.